This movie combines two of my videos from five years ago into a new and improved version. All that information in one spot, better lighting, different footage occasionally, and a script I've tinkered with in spots. So you can keep on using the same old detergent if you like it, and even the same old browser version on your computer. But you will want to check out this video A flurry of wings outside your window will liven up a dreary winter day. In freezing weather, we humans retreat to four walls and central heating. But birds, they live every minute of winter with only their feathers to protect them. That and whatever food they can scrounge to stoke their own tiny furnaces. Feed them what they like and they'll crowd around your feeders, often squabbling midair over the food. At our house in St. Louis, we feed the goldfinches and the pine siskins in the years they show up the finest grade of sunflower chips in 20 perch tube feeders. The tiny holes in those feeders keep the tiny chips from falling out. The finches are squinched together on there, but they're small and they like crowds. They carry them off each other like pool balls for a place on that feeding tube. Now, most people feed the finches niger seed, but the niger husks make for messy cleanup. Sure, the finest grade of sunflower chips costs a little more per bag, but the price evens out since there are no hulls. Much as we welcome sunny winter days, the overcast skies of a snowstorm bring their own rewards, a bounty of birds. The ground feeders, juncos and white-throated sparrows mainly, are joined by finches and cardinals. The overflow from the stacked and packed feeders. Be sure to pack down the snow under the feeders so the seeds don't fall through. In the most severe winter weather, unexpected species often show up. Be alert for rare visitors in the crowd under the feeders during snowstorms. Oh, and be sure you put a hood over the tube to protect the seed from moisture. It rots quickly if it gets wet. And be aware that you can do more harm than good feeding birds if you don't keep the feeders clean. Wash them thoroughly every two to four weeks, depending on the amount of traffic. Besides hoods to protect the seed, the other equipment you'll need is squirrel baffles. They'll save you gnawed up feeders and lots of seed. As long as there's no vegetation or bird bath within horizontal jumping distance of the feeder, the baffle will baffle squirrels because they're not good vertical jumpers. Feeding other birds besides finches is tricky. You want to minimize the starling, grackle, and house sparrow traffic. Putting wire cages around some feeders will keep most of the grackles and starlings away, not to mention squirrel. But nothing short of a nuclear blast will rid you of house sparrows. As long as you accept them as inevitable, you could hang a suet feeder or peanut feeder right next to a window with a protective extra cage on it and get close looks at Carolina wrens, nuthatches and downy woodpeckers, titmice and chickadees and house sparrows. You want suet because woodpeckers love it so much. And by the way, you can buy suet with hot peppers in it to repel the squirrels. Most squirrels hate hot pepper. And it's actually better to buy plain suet than the kind that's fancied up with berries and nuts because the grackles and starlings aren't very interested in plain suet. Tray feeders are popular because birds of every size fit comfortably on them. And by the way, you can buy tray feeders with a roof to protect the seeds and the birds during inclement weather. A lot of people put black oil sunflower seed in both tube and tray feeders because so many birds eat it. It's the favored food for chickadees, titmice, blue jays, cardinals, and house finches. The starlings don't have a strong enough bill to crack sunflower seeds, but grackles do. They and the starlings will stay away from tube feeders because they're too big to fit comfortably on them. 
but tray feeders are another matter. Those they like. We found out just how much they do when we put suet balls and dried mealworms in the tray feeder. For one winter, we generously stocked that tray and laughed as the local mockingbirds scattered starlings like ashes in a gust of wind, shooting them in every direction like a pool player breaking a rack of balls. It was fun. But the mocker wasn't always there and filling that tray with mealworms was a pricey way to attract the birds we least wanted. So we switched to safflower seed in the trays because grackles and starlings usually shun it. We still put black oil sunflower seed in tube feeders, so at least the smaller birds have their choice. And though it's true that all of them favor the black oil sunflower seed, they like variety. They'll eat safflower too. Our tube feeders attract house finches, house sparrows, sometimes cardinals, birds with sharp elbows that don't mind the jostle of a crowd. But the smallest birds, titmice and chickadees, prefer to arrive when the feeder is empty, snatch a sunflower seed, go to a nearby tree to crack it open, and then return for another seed. Now that your feeders are full, let me offer you some additional ideas on ways to feed the birds, as well as tips on how to make them notice your yard. Tips that are the avian equivalent of hanging a pink and orange neon sign flashing the words, Bird Mecca. The other ways besides feeders for drawing the birds to you range from extraordinarily easy to not so simple. Consider your lawn a bird feeder. We spread cheap seed on the ground, millet and cracked corn with some black oil sunflower seed mixed in for the winter visitors, white-throated sparrows and juncos. Lots of other birds also eat that. Cardinals, morning doves, blue jays, house sparrows, and here in St. Louis, even Eurasian tree sparrows, not to mention grackles and starlings. Since they arrive in such numbers and with such appetites, we'll feed them, but only the cheap stuff. Same goes for squirrels. Even when they only arrive a couple at a time, they have the appetite of teenage boys. For the sake of all who dine there, including the grackles and squirrels, we spread the seed near shrubs. Not so close that a cat could hide there and leap out at them, but close enough that they can dash for safety from a hawk. Those birds face danger all day and live by the maxim, better safe than sorry. If you want ground seed that won't lure all the squirrels, grackles, and starlings in the vicinity to your yard, then thistle, also called niger seed, is what you want. It's more expensive than the cheap mix, but you'll use so much less of it. Every few weeks, you'll want to switch where you spread that seed to avoid bacteria buildup. Even tree trunks can be bird feeders. Pick one close to a window and slather onto it either peanut butter or a product called bark butter, available at Wild Birds Unlimited. The birds see those treats as eggs benedict, and the fat and protein will help them survive cold temperatures. The founder of Wild Birds Unlimited created Bark Butter because he wanted a product that would attract shy little birds called brown creepers. It does that, and more. Now the finches won't visit the butters, but just about everybody else will. In January 2015, we had a Cape May warbler, very rare in Missouri in winter, showing up for the buttery treats. You needn't worry that the birds pecking on the tree will harm it, but if you want to be cautious, nail up a board or buy a bark butter feeder at Wild Birds Unlimited. We've been experimenting with ways to keep the starlings from swarming across bark butter like ants on candy. 
We squished a glob of it around a twig, hoping they'd be too heavy to sit there. And that didn't solve the problem, but it was fun to watch them bungee jumping. We spread it on the roof of this caged suet feeder. They can get to it, but not in swarms. Maybe we'll settle for that. Consider the ambiance of your outdoor restaurants. Now, I don't mean soft lighting and music. What you need is nearby vegetation where the flocks can flee when startled. Because birds are, well, flighty. Every one of them is as vigilant as a mosquito about to be slapped, and for good reason. They regularly see Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks swoop down on flock mates and devour them. So they're gone instantly if one of their number so much as hiccups. Shrubs and trees nearby make them feel safer. Make them actually safer. Ideally, though, besides bare vegetation, you would also provide lush winter vegetation. Not only as a place for birds to hide from hawks, but as a crucial shelter from rain and snow. Hollies can serve a dual purpose as shelter and food source. Birds prefer other kinds of berries to holly and winterberry. Winterberries are just deciduous hollies. And be aware that you'll need a male winterberry to pollinate any females you plant. But winterberry is the perfect name for them. When the chokeberries and beautyberries and such are gone, the birds will be grateful to have winterberries and hollyberries. And the nice thing about winterberries is that they add color on dreary days. Robins, the few who stay behind until the weather gets really grim, subsist on them and guard them. Any cardinal or junco trying to raid his pantry risks a brisk peck on the back. It's a good idea to have not only berries in the winter, but plants full of seeds. Watching finches jostle each other on feeders is fun, but so is seeing them twist and dangle off of spent goldenrod, bee balm, joe pieweed, and tardiva hydrangea. Wait till the end of winter to prune your grasses and flowering plants so that you can see birds gather seeds the old-fashioned way. Cutting back your plants in the early fall is like tidying your kitchen and putting the food in the fridge before your dinner guests arrive. People like a tidy kitchen and a tidy garden. I get that. But the birds don't. Be sure to give the birds water. A restaurant that served no beverages would do very little business. They don't ask for hot cocoa, but they'd rather not have to swallow snow and waste their precious body heat melting it. And besides, lots of times snow isn't even available. Much as they want the water, though, they'll only drink it if you keep the bird bath clean and the water fresh. And then there's the issue of baths. It's not that the birds are too delicate to sniff a little B.O. No, baths fluff up the matted undercoats of their plumage, turning them into warm, soft down. So if the water isn't frozen, those dainty-looking, hardy creatures will dunk themselves in it, knowing that once they're dry, they'll be better insulated. They belong to the Feathered Polar Bear Club for good reason. You could even take it a giant step further and provide them with running water. Any fresh water will lure birds to your yard, but running water? That'll make your yard a bird mecca. I won't kid you though, installing running water is more trouble. It's not all that hard to arrange for a bird bath with a trickle of water or a mister, but those don't work well in cold weather. Providing running water in cold weather is either a lot of trouble or considerable expense. We had a man-made stream bed that my husband dug and the birds loved it, but it always leaked. So we finally hired pros to put in one that functioned as it ought to. 
Next to the stream is a service berry tree, which provides a perfect staging area. We watch from a nearby window as birds wait for a turn in the stream or preen after a bath. And every bird we see bathing in that water provides a splash of happiness.